I'm, I'm uh, David Baumgart Turner. I'm the pastor here at Church of the Crossroads. Let me rephrase that. I am honored to be the pastor here at Church of the Crossroads, a truly wonderful, special place. And the fact that we can have an evening like this is part of, part of what makes it such a wonderful and special place. Um, I want to introduce real quick the uh, head of the Hawaii Interfaith Power and Light, Travis Idol. So, thank you. Thank you. A lot of familiar faces, but it's always wonderful to, to meet new people. And, and we are very pleased to have this opportunity to, to invite Paul to come to speak to us uh, tonight. We we're just talking with Jolinda. Fortunately, I wear a couple of hats. One of them is at the University of Hawaii, where I first heard about this. And when they were looking for a venue for Paul, because unfortunately what happened on the Big Island, the uh, ongoing eruptions there kind of uh, upset his plans, we're like, we can take this on. HIPL and with its partner Crossroads, uh, um, we, many of you who have attended our events before know that this is uh, old hat for us. And Paul uh, has the perfect message um, and the perfect topic uh, to fit with uh, what HIPL is about. So Hawaii Interfaith Power and Light, for those of you who don't know, um, is a nonprofit organization. We're a state chapter of a national movement uh, that brings communities of faith uh, to bear on issues of gl climate change, global warming, energy issues. Um, and so we really emphasize the moral and, and spiritual dimensions of this issue. And I think Paul really is going to speak to some of that uh, tonight. So we're really pleased uh, to have him here. You want to know more about us? Just HIPL.org or come speak to me afterwards. Um, and I guess I'll turn it over to uh, you. Want to say a few things? All right. Okay, thanks. So many moons ago, many more than many moons ago, I, was, uh, I had the privilege of being the chaplain at Punahou School, and when I arrived there in 1994, there was this amazing person who was doing this stuff called world music with young kids, and she was, had all sorts of strange and wonderful instruments, gamelons and all sorts of things like that, and the kids came alive in her, in her, um, uh, under her instruction. And so I loved the fact that we got to work together for many, many years, watch her child grow up, she watched mine grow up, and then all of a sudden her name comes across in an email about this wonderful opportunity to have this wonderful speaker and could we find a way to do it, and we went through many different iterations to find this evening, but we did. So let me introduce Jolinda Susilo, who many of you know, who will introduce our guest for this evening. Thank you. What an honor to be with all of you. Um, I'm a member of the Baha'i faith who believes all world religions are, all religions are one, and we are all working toward that same goal. Sustainability is very near and dear to our hearts. I have the honor of introducing Mr. Paul Hanley, who is the author and expert on sustainability and the environment. He has published four books and over 1,600 articles on the environment, sustainable development and agriculture. His book 11 addresses the issue of how to sustain a planet with 11 billion people expected to populate the earth before the end of this century. Um, I know you're a very humble man, but I was asked by Molly to share this, that Paul is a recipient of the Canadian Environmental Award. He lives in Saskatchewan with his wife and his youngest of three sons. Welcome, Mr. Hanley. This is to bring the aloha to you. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful Hawaiian welcome. And a welcome at the church and the Baha'i community and interfaith power and light. It's my wife and I, my wife Holly is here, and it's really wonderful to be in Hawaii. And we've spent some time on Molokai and the Big Island and now here and we're going to Maui as well just to check it out and see how things are and it's it's exciting we were coming here for uh, uh, the Baha'i Summer School which was going to be held in a place called Kilauea Camp <laughs> and that was the plan but I guess the earth had different plans for us but we already had our tickets so heck we're going to come anyway and uh, then Different activities have been set up, and it's great to connect with people and talk about these important issues. And I thought it was kind of neat when we got to came to 
crossroad, the Crossroads Church, because I thought, well, wow, that's a great uh, tie into what I'm talking about, because I think humanity really is at a crossroads. And so we have this idea of, does humanity have a future? And people are really, I think people who have uh, a lot of knowledge about this topic are actually seriously asking that question. And I think there's a lot of concern amongst people, and perhaps a lot with youth as well, wondering what our future is if there are people who listen to the news and know what's going on around the world. So it's uh, some scary prospects. So I wrote this book, Eleven, which I'll ex be explaining what it's all about as we go along. But uh, this, this question sort of really comes out of the learning for the research for that book. So the book, in a sense, I, I've tried to kind of boil it down to a couple of propositions that I can share with you. And one is this idea that a uniting humanity will heal the planet. So uh, this is kind of based on this idea that the ecosphere, or the, the global environment, is really, uh, in a sense, a reflection of our inner lives. So the... Uh, whatever is going on within us in terms of our inner conditions and our relationships with others is reflected in the environment around us. And in a sense, then, the environmental problem becomes a social problem. Oh, okay. We're just still a little bit too far away from the, from the screen. Maybe we'll just pull, it, just pull it up just a bit more. Oh, well, no. no, it's got to be up a little bit. How is this lighting? I think the lighting's good, yeah. I mean, you want the middle? I think this is good with the lighting part. Yeah. Nice. Just a little bit further down. <laughs> if we can get it. Can you bring the screen down further? Oh. Like Somebody's thinking. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's great. So this idea, uh, the proposition in the book is this idea that uniting humanity will heal the planet because of our, our exterior environment is sort of uh, conditioned by our inner environment. So that's the first proposition. The idea that the environmental problem we're having is in a sense a social problem. And the second proposition is more or less the opposite that the work of healing the planet is one of the things that will unite humanity. So these two ideas go together very, very closely. And it's interesting that uh, there's this idea that comes to us from, um, from science, that we have the potential at this time in history, because it's kind of an unprecedented time, to really achieve uh, the unity of the human race. And Edward O. Wilson, who is one of America's great scientists, talks about this idea. He's the person who really popularized concepts like biodiversity. And he talks about the potential to turn Earth into a paradise today. And interestingly, he's, he's an atheist himself, but he kind of uses this, this language of religion to talk about the future. And uh, he says that the ultimate goal of humanity is this idea of the unity of the human race. So if my propositions are correct, and it's, we have the potential to unite humanity, be truly united, then we have the potential to transform the external environment as well. But uh, Dr. Wilson talks about uh, really the, the block for this in many ways comes from our, our evolutionary past. So people have evolved in a sense to uh, be concerned about themselves and their families in the short term. So their self-interest in the short term is what really helped human beings to evolve, evolve in, many, in many cases. But we now live in a global society that demands a really kind of the opposite kind of mentality where we're other-centered and we're looking for long-term solutions. So the necessity to kind of really revise our thinking and in a sense overcome our evolutionary history is before us. And uh, Wilson talks about this idea of humanity being in a kind of a uh, youthful stage, that human beings, or, or humanity as a whole, is something like a human being. It goes through uh, childhood, youth, and maturity. 
And so he says, now in a sense our dysfunction may be that we're still in this youthful state. And youthful state often involves quite a bit of turmoil. But it's a stage that's heading towards maturity. So where are we at? Well, I think we are maturing as a human race. And there are signs of this in a kind of the emergence of, of global institutions, for example. Uh, we're seeing movements for peace all over the world. Uh, the organizations of civil society are focusing on this idea of the unity of the human race. And uh, institutions like the United Nations are there helping that process. Uh, st another great American scientist, Steven Pinker, talks about this, uh, this process in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. And he talks about how Contrary to what seems to be the case if we listen to the news, we're actually in the most peaceful period in human history. So he says the first 10 years of this century are actually the most peaceful ever. And in a sense, I think the, the kind of light that we're experiencing of, of unity kind of really increases the depths of the shadows. So it looks like the, the exact opposite. But in many ways, we're, we're improving as, as a human race. One of the key elements of this has been the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The concept of human rights uh, coming to us and really helping us to realize that every human being has unalienable rights. So this is a, a signature uh, development in human history. So according to the propositions I started with at the beginning, the idea that, uh, you know, as we become more united, we'll see improvements in the environment. Is that, is that happening? And of course, in many ways we'd say no, but we are seeing a change in consciousness and the emergence of, of really powerful uh, concepts in ecology and the awareness of the environment and the problems related to the environment. So that is starting to happen. And we're seeing things like this, the idea that a right to a healthy environment is a human right and it's part of the constitutions of a hundred nations. And uh, this idea of, uh, of the connection between the environment and human rights is growing. Unfortunately, a couple of the countries that haven't accepted this are the United States and Canada. But it is a growing movement around the world, and we're even seeing countries who are starting to give, uh, give rights equivalent to a human right to things like rivers. So there's a growing consciousness. And we're having things like the Earth Summit, the Millennium Summit, the Paris Climate Accord, and so on, which are at least uh, on the level of discourse, we're starting to get the ideas right. Now there's a bit of a problem in that it's very difficult for us to put these things into action. And I think part of that is this idea that there's sort of twin processes going on, a process of, of integration, which I've been talking about, but also this really powerful process of disintegration. And uh, the world order uh, is, I think the old world order is collapsing and perhaps needs to collapse for a new one to come into its place. So there's these simultaneous processes of collapse and, and regrowth. So we're seeing uh, movements for this kind of uh, conceptualizing a new world order. So what drives these processes of integration and also the process of disintegration? Well, um, this great spiritual teacher, Abdul Baha, talked about this idea that the reality of man is his thought. So our thought, in a sense, creates our reality. And the same idea comes in science. Uh, very interesting scientist, Vladimir Vernadsky, a Ukrainian scientist, who developed the concept of the biosphere, that the whole Earth is one integrated system. And he talked also about a concept called the noosphere, that there's kind of a realm of thought around the world as well. And so this idea that what, we, what really creates our reality is focused human attention. So what we pay attention to collectively happens and becomes a reality. So that can be kind of a negative thing or a positive thing, because often we focus on negative things and we create a negative reality, but the opposite is also possible and happens. So with this collective focus attention, humanity has altered the ecosphere. The ecosphere is this thin layer of life around the surface of the planet. And we've 
uh, altered it in really dramatic ways. Uh, for example, this, uh, this shows the weight of land mammals. So someone figured out how much do all the mammals on Earth weigh, and including us, human beings. So the dark squares in the middle are human beings by weight. The lighter gray squares are uh, our animals, our livestock, and the green squares are what's left of wild wild uh, mammals in the world. So this massive change taking place where we're really replacing other species in terms of our, our numbers and our weight. So scientists now are starting to talk about this idea of this age we're in is the Anthropocene. So we talk about these different geological ages uh, where there's different factors that shape the earth and today this seems like the key factor is human beings. So we still have volcanoes, as you're very aware, and they change the world in dramatic ways, but not so much as human beings and our activities. We're perhaps the most significant transformative force on the planet today. So in a sense, our thoughts, our values shape the world, and this is really quite literal. The outer world reflects our inner world. The ecologist Stan Rowe talked about this idea, the landscapes of our making match and reflect society's cultural inscapes. So what we think about, what goes on within us, is reflected in our landscapes outside us. And the same idea from Shoghi Effendi, this idea of our inner life molds the environment, and also the other way around. And even if you look at quantum physics and that, that conception of reality, we see that uh, human observation actually generates uh, the world at the, at the quantum level. And this, yes? Uh, okay. My wife says so, I just... Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get it. So, um, yeah, this idea that we are participants in bringing into being not only the near and here, but also the far away and long ago. So this idea that uh, our observation and attention actually creates the world around us. So I want to give you an example of how this is literally true. This is a part of the province of Saskatchewan where I live. And because of the topography here, it wasn't able to be developed for agriculture like most of uh, the southern part of our province. But it was shaped by the indigenous mind. So the people that lived there for, for millennia, uh, through hunting pressures, through fire and so on, did transform the landscape, but not to the point where they, they uh, really deeply changed ecological values. But then along came the, the settlers and the colonial mind. And this is what the landscape looks like now. So this uh, complete transformation so you're flying into where the city I live in, Saskatoon, and it all looks like this as far as the eye can see. And so, in a sense, it reflects this kind of industrial model that was developing in the, in the uh, 18th and 19th century when this land was settled. How do we produce food? How do we do it the most efficient way possible? How do we get it to where we want? You know, putting in railroads and roadways everywhere and get the food to market in Europe to feed people in the Industrial Revolution. So the, the concepts that, uh, the mentality that was brought from Europe transformed the landscape totally. And then today, I, I, I was thought this, when I saw this picture, which is Las Vegas, I thought, wow, that sure looks like a circuit board. And so maybe even, uh, you know, in this digital age, our world starts to look like the things we think about a lot. Wow. Uh, so, in this Anthropocene era where human beings are the most important transformative force, it's really important what we pay attention to. What do we focus our attention on? And unfortunately, I think we, we uh, often focus it on things which are not very important. Uh, this kind of this idea of a, this huge sort of spectacle that we're creating on a mass scale. Things like our sporting our events, our entertainments, our focus on media, social media and so on, really absorbing most of our attention, in a sense putting us to sleep so that we can't really appreciate 
what the values of the world are, the world, the, the environment in which we live. So there's this, you know, idea that when our attention is focused on, on these things, uh, on the acquisition of power and the acquisition of things, or it's sort of blinded by our, our focus on this great spectacle of entertainments and so on that we're involved in, that our social sphere and our ecological sphere become fragmented, very much like our thinking. So this uh, picture really had a big impact on me because uh, it, you know, I was thinking uh, it looks like a science fiction, kind of a zombie movie or something, but these are real people living in Syria Palestinians in a, in a camp that's been utterly destroyed. And so more and more people in the world are in this uh, predicament. And I noticed the same picture on the poster over there on the wall. Uh, millions of people being displaced and trying to find a place where they can be safe. So in a sense, the world has gone into what I'm calling a kind of permanent emergency. And so this kind of uh, attention that we have, focus that we have, the values that we have are kind of leading to this, this really uh, uh, disintegration of the world order that we're used to, we've been used to. And so one of the ways we're seeing that is in this idea of climate change and our overheated planet. And in a sense, I'm seeing it as a symptom of this fragmentation of humanity. So that picture is... Uh, I think it's a 2015. Each of those dots is either a forest fire or a, a hot spot where they're concerned about forest fire happening. So that year in the summer there were about 1,500 fires burning simultaneously. But at the same time, interestingly, Indonesia was experiencing the same kind of level of fires. So a massive problem around the world uh, in the boreal zone and other parts of the world, fire. And in uh, northern Canada, northern Alberta, the, the, one of the uh, oil capitals of Canada, Fort McMurray, uh, kind of ironically, I don't know if that's the right term, uh, there, there was a fire such that they had to evacuate the entire city on one road leading out of the north. And for a, long, for a period of time, people were driving through walls of fire that were scorching their vehicles on both sides. And 35,000 people had to move. And so here they are uh, joining now 65 million uh, social and environmental refugees in the world. So it's not just the poor. It's people in these very wealthy cities. So we're seeing um, this fragmentation on a mass scale throughout the globe. And my whole presentation is not going to be depressing. So, but I just gotta, I've got to set the, the stage here. So in 2015, these major catastrophic events exceeded 1,000 for the first time. So each of those dots is one of the catastrophes that are, that are things like floods and, and major fires and, and so on. Uh, and uh, droughts is also in there. So the big dots are events that cost more than a billion dollars. And the other major ones are in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So this massive impact all over the world. And companies like uh, Munich Re uh, are reinsurance companies. They're the companies that insure insurance companies. And they're very carefully tracking over the, the last a few decades the impact uh, that all of these disasters are having on their business. And it's huge. So as you know, sometimes people can no longer get insurance uh, for, let's say, coastal areas and so on. So most of these disasters, too, are not geophysical events. They're not earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, and so on. They're remaining more or less stable. It's things that are related to climate, uh, things like floods and fires and so on. And unfortunately, most of the people who are worst affected are the poor, but not exclusively. So this is uh, the oil capital of Canada, Calgary, underwater the whole downtown area, the most expensive uh, disaster in, in Canadian history. So these things are happening more and more. So things we used to call like a hundred year events, it might ha there might be a flood in every hundred years, are now starting to happen possibly even every year. So it's uh, not good. Now, when these disastrous events happen, there's also 
kind of a cascade of impacts in many cases. So we see things like climate change happening, uh, but that can cause uh, a food crisis. Uh, and that might also cause a water crisis. And there might be now kind of fighting over who gets the water. Is it uh, one country or another? Or is it a city versus farmers? These things are happening all over the place. But they might also relate to social instability. Places like Syria, uh, where there's a war, some people have traced it to climate change because of a severe drought that caused about a million people, a million farmers to move into the city, which kind of destabilized everything. So this can happen, and there might relate to terrorist attacks. Everything kind of works together in this kind of cascade, which can be quite troublesome and destructive. And one of the things that drives this is this idea of continuous economic growth. And uh, this is kind of our mantra, our focus uh, for all economies in the world. We have to keep growing them. But when we start to see things like these catastrophic events happening, you know, some economists are saying, well, our economic growth is actually uneconomic growth. And we're actually getting more ilth than wealth. So ilth is an old term that's coming back. It's kind of like bad, bad wealth. So things like, uh, let's say, uh, the use of vehicles is a good thing. Uh, people can get around and transport things and so on. But let's say you have so many vehicles that you can't move. You're stuck in traffic. That would be an example of ILF. So we're having more and more of that. And here we have uh, these uh, disasters happening and increasing, and also the financial costs going up and up and up into the hundreds of billions of dollars. So this is uneconomic growth. Another thing I think that is, is uh, really troublesome is this trend towards extreme inequality between people. And if my, my propositions are correct, that we need human unity in order to restore the ecosphere, uh, that human unity will be reflected outside of us in our physical environment, what happens when there's this extreme disparity between people where, you know, the top 1% starts to capture most of the wealth? So this is another deep concern. Now, a lot of this is uh, a result of uh, what one economist talks about moving from an empty wor world to a full world. So an empty world is a world that's relatively empty of people and our stuff. And so here we have the idyllic country road. And now it's become a full world and it's full of people and full of our stuff. And this has happened rather quickly in terms of time. If you go back, let's say, to 10,000 BC and the population most of the population really just starts to grow in the last couple thousand years, but mainly just in about the last uh, 50 years or so, most of the growth. So it took 10,000 generations to get one billion people around 1800. But then it, the next billion, it only took six generations, around 1925. Two more generations to hit three billion, and then just one generation to hit each of the next billion marks. So the population is increasing very rapidly. And along with that, the population of all of our stuff, the impacts we have on the environment. I don't know if you can see each individual a box there, but things like, uh, you know, this is the world population suddenly going up, but also our economy suddenly going up. And then our use of everything, fertilizers, paper, water, all of them suddenly expanding very, very rapidly. So they call it the Great Acceleration. And one of the reasons for this was this development of the idea of the consumer economy. So maybe we've given people most of the stuff they really need already. Now, how do we keep the economy growing? Well, let's give them stuff they don't really need. Uh, or maybe just kind of fulfill people's wants and maybe even inv invent wants that we didn't know we had. So in America, 120,000 malls. There's our livestock. 25 billion animals that we have that outweigh all the other animals in the world. Our buildings made of concrete um, in many cases, which is uh, one of the main uh, sources of climate change. They all have to be heated and cooled and lighted. 
And all of this takes this master resource, oil and coal and so on, to keep it running, and about 35 billion barrels a year equivalent. And this is Mordor or Fort McMurray, Alberta and Canada, the oil sands. And that's what it looks like. And that's what we're doing to the earth to support this kind of um, growth that we have around the world. And so we're seeing more and more scenes like this. I had to throw this one in for Hawaii, although I think this is in Malaysia. But uh, more and more of this garbage and, and fouling the earth. So in fact, now we have about 7.5 billion people and Earth's biocapacity, kind of, its kind of ability to support us and to uh, absorb our emissions and waste and so on, is being exceeded right now by about 60 to 70 percent. When I wrote the book, I think it was 60, but I, somebody just showed me a statistic. They're saying 70 percent exceeded. And that means we're it's using about 1.6, 1.7 planets worth of resources to support us as we now uh, are situated. But the sad thing, and I'm soon going to stop saying really sad things, uh, is we've only just begun. So most of the growth that's anticipated is yet to come. So all this growth through the millennia, we're going to do more growth in the next few decades than in the past millennia. So back when I was born, way back when, there were about uh, 2.5 billion people. We're headed towards 11 billion people at the end of the century which is, uh, my book's called Eleven, and that's why it's called Eleven. Uh, and along with that, the, uh, the green line is the world's economy sitting around four, five, four or five trillion dollars when I was a kid and headed towards about 250 trillion dollars in size. And then we're in lockstep, the ecological footprint, the impact of everything that we do, the blue, oops, the blue line. Just a sec here. So, uh, yeah, we're headed towards uh, needing the equivalent of, if, if, we, if we follow this, this path forward, we would need five Earths to support us, and of course we only have one. So what do we need to do? We have to somehow get back here around 1975, the last time we used one Earth, and then we have to sustain that kind of uh, level of economy. So how do we do that? How do you return to a 1975 footprint and still add about 50% more people in the world and help the people who are, are really, uh, uh, don't ha have basic human needs met, raise their standard of living? So, wow, we have a problem. So that's why I think there's all this denial going on, like who really wants to think about this? So we're trying to, you know, what I'm trying to do is kind of read our reality. What is it on a global scale? And it's not, doesn't look very good. And so uh, denial is a very common response. Another one is kind of going into this apocalyptic thinking. So if you're a sci-fi fan like, like me, uh, there's all these movies about uh, zombies and the living dead and, and you know, kind of this really negative view of what the future is going to be like. And even our scientists, people like Martin Rees, the astronomer royal of Britain, wrote this book, Our Final Century. So he's saying, well, we're kind of screwed, basically. Uh, he gave us a 50-50 chance of surviving. And uh, uh, Stephen Hawking said zero chance of surviving on this planet. So are we doomed? Well, there's different ways of looking at this, and I'd like to try and explain to you why I think we aren't doomed. And uh, one of the ideas I, I really liked was this, this idea from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, this idea of the difference between optimism and hope. And he talks about this idea of covenantal time uh, being different than normal time. So if we think in terms of, of, a, of a covenant that we have with the Creator, uh, it generates the idea of hope. So, you know, optimism is maybe this kind of naive belief that, oh, everything will be okay. We'll just develop new technologies. We'll solve everything. No problem. 
And we just let the market operate. If we just let it operate freely, everything will be okay. It'll solve everything. Now, hope is the opposite. It's the idea that you really understand what's going on, but you believe in the capacity of humanity to change and transform. So optimism is passive. Hope is an active concept, but it really requires a lot of courage. It's just what these guys are singing about right here. So I really like this concept, which is also a biblical idea from, you know, it's a verse from the, from the Old Testament. I'm a prisoner of hope. And different people have been using this, Cornell West, Bishop Tutu, the idea that, you know, things are looking bad, but I, I believe we can transform and change. So one of the reasons we think this is possible is this idea from ecology, which is called panarchy theory, or the panarchy model, that shows how in every complex system, there's sort of these processes of change take place which are inevitable, where a system kind of grows and then collapses and then is restored, perhaps in a different form. And so uh, the ecologists apply this idea to human society because we're sort of a social ecological system. So we're headed, according to uh, the people who developed this theory, to a major pulse of transformation because human beings have been building up all of this capital through the millennia, and eventually, because systems always change, we're going to change. And they say, but we have to be careful not to, uh, uh, a term has been used, rear view mirrorism, like kind of go forward looking in the rear view mirror, because you know the things that we did in the past don't work anymore in this new reality. So they say we have to try new things. Uh, and they, they talk about diverse adventures in living. We have to try all kinds of new ideas, and then when the time comes when civilizational collapse occurs, all these ideas will be there that we can adopt. And all over the world we're seeing this happen. So I love this term prosumers. Uh, people changing from being just consumers to also, for example, producing their own power, producing their own food, producing their own transportation with their own energy. And now whole communities starting to change, where they become uh, net zero communities. They don't have any uh, climate emissions, or they have net zero emissions. And ideas like this, where people, you're probably finding that here, people starting to focus on producing more of their own food. And they talk about 800 million people in the world as gardeners and urban farmers. And whole countries are starting to change their energy systems, such as uh, Germany. France has decided to not explore for oil and gas anymore. And we're actually seeing this big shift happening. Global investment in fossil fuels, still $130 billion. It's a lot of money. But look at the investment in renewables, things like solar and wind, $286 billion. So a doubling. So there is a, trans, uh, a, chain, a trend towards transformation happening. So in my book, I talk about many of these things that are happening around the world that are an incredible movement of, of hope and, and uh, possibilities and capacities being built. But the question is, you know, when, in a sense, everything that needs to be done to make this change happen is happening, the question is, why aren't we doing it uh, universally? What's stopping us? So here we get into the idea of, you know, how do you change? And I often think... A human being, like me, I find it hard to change a habit that I have, a single habit. And I think we all do, uh, whether you know, it's eat less or whatever it is. But now we have to all change all of our habits. And how is that possible? Well, I think, the, I think we're starting to understand that the political approach of partisan politics is really inadequate. That what we need is a much more profound transformation at an unprecedented scale, what we're really talking about is creating a new human culture worldwide, also a new agriculture, and in a sense, really, a new human race. We have to be so different in order to live in this 11 billion world. We need an ethical revolution. So what do I mean by that? Well, this is what I see as kind of our current value continuum. So the things above the dotted line are not considered to be that important. And what we value in terms of what do we spend our time on, what do we spend our attention on, our money, uh, our 
on this continuum between unnecessary and destructive in many cases. So things like this heavy, heavy consumption of things that are often frivolous, militarization, uh, which takes trillions of dollars, and things like addictions, which really uh, capture human attention and debilitate so many people. So look at this table of what I call wasted wealth. And we have things like these vices, uh, gambling, prostitution, pornography, $600 billion a year spent on those things. And just go through the whole, the whole list here, down to this consumer goods for the top 20% of the world's population costing $20 trillion. And if you add it all up, we have almost half of the world's gross domestic product, our economy, is going into things which, not entirely uh, useless or destructive, but many of them are. Now, that's depressing, but if you flip the thought the other way, it means, well, hold it, there's all this, all this wealth that we're creating which we don't really need to put on into these things. What if we put it into different things that are constructive? So what if we changed our value system and we looked at things that are transcendent, things like building these qualities within human beings, education, building our relationships, building our spiritual values, building a, a, a kind of a ethic of service instead of uh, concern for ourself. What if we focused all our wealth on constructive ecological restoration and meeting basic human needs and these other things became less important? So. There's a potential for releasing our wealth for reconstructing civilization, for healing the ecosphere. It's, it's huge. So um, these right values, right, right ideas can really help to transform our world. And I want to show you just a short video now of how a community came together on a very large scale to do a, transform, a transformation of the ecosphere. So it required a lot of work on building human unity, building unity at the community level, bringing in governments and international agencies to bring about this change in China's Los Plateau. So what we see here, you'll see is a filmmaker who went in to this area of China, which is kind of the cradle of Chinese civilization, which has been badly eroded and, dest and destroyed. Uh, to a great extent, he takes up uh, pans across the landscape and then he goes back about 15 years later and pans does the same pans. And you'll, so you'll see what's, what's possible if we all can get it together. Um, let's see. China's Lus Plateau is a region that stretches for 640,000 square kilometers across north-central China. Unspoilt valleys in neighboring Sichuan show us how it might once have looked. It's the sort of natural abundance that is necessary to support an emerging civilization. How could a landscape with such potential have been reduced to this? When Chinese scientists and civil engineers began to survey the area, they realized that several thousand years of agricultural exploitation had denuded the hills and valleys of vegetation. The relentless grazing of domestic animals on the slopes meant that there was no chance for young trees and shrubs to grow. The rainfall no longer seeped into the earth, but simply washed down the hillsides, taking the soil with it. Over millennia, this progressively destroyed the region's fertility. When this happens over an area as extensive as the plateau, millions of tons of silt are swept down into the Yellow River. When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results.
The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. So it's kind of, that's kind of an upper. I, I really like that one. The whole film is called Hope in a Time of Climate Change, and you can watch it on, on YouTube. So this incredible transformation, which is, uh, the Los Plateau is about the size of France, and the area that they're working on is about the size of Belgium. And now uh, China is the top tree planter in the world. Now they're working on an area about the size of Ireland that they're replanting into trees. So people coming together can really transform the landscapes in, in dramatic ways. So uh, w this idea that our unity of thought can really move the world is really important. So if our thought and our attention can do negative things, it can also do positive things. So one of the things I talk about in, quite in depth in my book is about the need to transform our food and agricultural system in order to feed uh, the increase in the world's population and also the many, many people who don't have enough uh, to eat today. And one of the real interesting potentials is this idea of agroecology. So this is uh, about uh, a third of the world's population are small farmers and their families. So we're talking about farmers who are working on, let's say, a, a hectare, uh, a farm maybe a hectare, which is a couple of acres in size. And so most of the increase in population in the world that's coming will be in areas where farming is done in this way, places like Africa, South Asia, and so on. So uh, the potential of this is really amazing in terms of global transformation. So in a sense, I think these small farmers may be even be the pivot of change. And uh, the scientist Ratan Lal has talked about the potential for this, of uh, the idea of carbon farming, and paying small farmers for their services. Uh, and it's a very small amount that's needed. So about $25 billion a year on a, would be uh, needed. It sounds like a lot of money, but look at that table I talked about, $600 billion being spent on prostitutions and pornography and so on. Uh, about $50 a farm. Most of these people are earning around $500 a year on average very small uh, incomes, so $50 is huge and will allow them to really transform their farming methods. So we're talking about uh, a big potential here. About 3.5 billion hectares in the world are degraded, which is pretty much the size of the whole continent of Africa. And so supporting the rural poor to restore their land would really be a key to eliminating extreme poverty and hunger, because it's mainly the rural poor who are in this uh, situation where they're living on very small incomes. And it would also increase their biocapacity, help to ameliorate climate change, because you're taking carbon from the atmosphere and putting it into the soil and plants. It would avoid this, this problem of the, you know, the boat people uh, trying to get out of their countries, this by, because most of those people want to stay where they are. So it's a matter of improving their conditions. And it would be the equivalent of creating a whole new continent. And this can be done also on a larger scale in, in more uh, the industrial farming areas as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the power of individuals and in this area of change uh, in terms of our ecological restoration. And my next book is an, a biography of this man uh, who is kind of little known, but I think a real environmental hero. He was called the man of the trees, Richard St. Barr Baker. And I'm calling him the first global conservationist. And he worked from the 1920s forward on these ideas like agroecology, agroforestry, restoration of deserts, and inspired many people to, to uh, change. One of his greatest uh, goals was to try to reforest the Sahara Desert, which is about the size of the United States. And he said what we should start to do is build this great green wall across, uh, across the southern part of the, the Sahara, about a 30 mile wide uh, row of trees and farms and so on. And everybody ignored him when he talked about it in the 1950s, but now it's actually being done. So when it's completed, if it's completed, uh, this talking about this structure 
biological structure being the largest structure in the world. And really interesting, if we think about the potential of individuals and the potential of children and youth, uh, this young man, Felix Finkbeiner, heard about Richard St. Barr Baker, Baker and Wangara Matai, the Nobel Prize winner for her work in tree planting in Kenya. And uh, he said, we should do something about this and started to organize children when he was nine years old. They've started a global movement I think it's now they now have 46,000 child ambassadors for tree planting. And they were so successful, he's now 19, that the United Nations transferred its uh, tree planting program to his organization. And together they've planted about 15 billion trees already. So one kid's idea, you know, bringing along, uh, being a leader and bringing along other people to help him, really helping to transform the world. So what about these transformational processes? How do we make this kind of change happen on a world scale? Well, I really like this quotation from uh, Buckminster Fuller. And he talks about this idea of, you know, if we, if we try for kind of political change in terms of protest and fighting for different, uh, different approaches, other people fight back. And he talks about the need to just create much better models and make the old ones obsolete. So how do we do that? And I think, uh, in, in the book I talk about these different steps to transformation, the idea of really developing the capacity to read our reality. What's really going on in the world around us, in our communities, in our countries? Uh, developing unity of thought about what's happening and what needs to happen. We need to balance the material and spiritual so I talked about these deep values, the transcendent values, things like service and so on, being balanced with our material needs, very critical. And developing this sort of capacity for service that what we're about is not just self-interest, but working for the betterment of life for all people and for the earth itself. And then finally, we, we definitely need action orientation. And this all has to happen planet-wide, systematically. And it has to involve individuals, what building capacity in individuals, in communities, and in our institutions of governance and so on. So this is being done. People are working on the, as I've talked about individuals, there's been work done by institutions on community levels, things like the M Millennium Village projects in Africa. I uh, like the children's, uh, Harlem Children's Zone in the U.S., experiments with holistic models that are really interesting. Um, I think that one of the problems with this, though, is many of our models of development are really talk about helping people from uh, poorer people move into the middle class. Now, what if that happens and they all become like other middle class people and we start to, it, it just hastens the destruction of the environment. So I think we really need to have a very different model. This is where I came on this idea of the Ruhi Institute, which is a, a model developed in uh, rural Colombia in 1975 from then on, and is now spreading all around the world. So it's really a process-based approach to building capacity in individuals and in communities and in institutions for this kind of profound change. And it's really based on the idea of education, but not education in classrooms. It's more of a, a self-generating educational process where we work together to train more and more people and train, once trained, they train others and so on. So it, it expands exponentially. So uh, it's worldwide. It's now operating in about 5,000 geographic clusters around the world. It addresses very deeply the spiritual conditions and as well as material conditions. It operates at the local level, but it also gathers information at the local level and shares it on a regional, national, and international level. So we learn through thousands of activities going on what works best, and we share that knowledge. And then I think this is also important that it's not just about um, kind of this idea of the poor need to be developed. It's the idea that everybody needs to be developed. And in fact, it may be the rich and the middle class that need development more than the poor. It's us that need to, to really change our behaviors in really profound ways, because we're the ones who are having the most impact on the natural world. 
And importantly, I think it has to involve adults, but also children and youth. And in many cases, I think it needs to be the youth who are the leaders, because they're going to inherit the, the world. And I want to show you now, uh, just in closing, a short fit, uh, video about one community in India that's adopted this approach. And it shows how the community has used this approach to really address their key social issues. Now, my idea uh, is this, this idea that if we become more united as, as people, as a community, we'll start to transform the environment. And in this community, you're even starting to see that happen as well. So just see what they're doing and think about how would we apply the same process here where we have a different set of problems. भारत के उत्तर पूर्व दिशा में बिहार स्थित है यहाँ पे गौतम बुद्ध आए और अपना ज्ञान अर्जन किया बिहार सिर्फ क्लस्टर में 6000 ऐसे लोग होंगे जो समुदाय निर्माण में अपना योगदान दे रहे हैं पिछले कुछ रॉल में लगभग 1000 से ज्यादा किशोर हैं जो किशोर कार्यक्रम से गुजर चुके हैं हमारे किशोर समूह का नाम सत्यवादिता है आज हम सब पर्यावरण के शुद्धता के लिए वृक्षारोपण करने जा रहे हैं लगभग 900 के आसपास में ऐसे बच्चे हैं जो बच्चों के कार्यक्रम से गुजर चुके हैं और लगभग 500 ऐसे व्यस्क हैं जो संस्थान प्रक्रिया पे गुजर चुके हैं। ताट प्रार्थनाएं सभा को संचालित किया जा रहा है। तभी आते हैं और उत्साह के साथ भाग लेते हैं और उनसे प्रेरणा पाते हैं। इन सब गतिविधियों की वजह से व्यक्ति की समुदाय और संस्थाओं में गहरा बदलाव आ रहे हैं संस्कृति के स्तर पे बहुत सारी बदलाव आ रहे हैं जिसकी वजह से सदियों से चली आ रही पूर्वाग्रहों से लोग धीरे-धीरे मुक्त हो रहे हैं हमारे भारत देश में जाति प्रथा की जो भेदभाव है बहुत गहन रूप से जकल रखा है यह एक सामाजिक बनावटी व्यवस्था है उच्च जाति और निम्न जाति के लोग आपस में न घुल मिल पाते हैं न बैठ पाते हैं न बातें कर पाते हैं न साथ में खाना खा पाते हैं जिस रूही बन पड़ने से मेरा अच्छा बहुत दिमाग खुला उससे सीख मिलता है कि जाति प्रथा नहीं हो सकता है हम आज अभी देखते हैं तो बहुत खुशी आनंद लगता है पहले जो दुख किसी को भोगना नहीं पड़ता है पहले लोग बोलते थे कि मैंने अलग अलग आप घर में नहीं आना चाहिए बाहर आना चाहिए दूर भाव करना चाहिए तो वे स्टेटिंग सर्कल के साथ हम लोग जुटे तो हम लोग के बहुत भाव के नाम मिट्टी जाने के लगा और स्वागत करने के लिए हम लोग आमंत्रित रहते हैं अपने बच्चों को प्रवेश करते हुए हम निर्णय लिए कि हम नहीं बताएं कि किस जाति का है ताकि उसको मन में विचार नहीं आएगा कि ऊंचा है या नीचा और ना ही सामने वाले को ऊंची या नीची नजर से देख पाए सभी को समान नजर से देख पाए हमारे संस्कृति में व्यस्क और युवाओं के बीच काफी दूरियां थी पहले देखिए जो बुजुर्ग लोग अक्सर हमने कुछ बोल देते थे तो जो हम लोग को मान लेवे पड़ता था लेकिन संस्थान प्रक्रिया आने से काफी बदलाव हुआ अब हम लोग के अवसर मिल रहा है कि एक साथ बैठ करके युवा और बुजुर्ग लोग दोनों मिलके परामर्श करते हैं और फिर परामर्श करके ही निर्णय लेते हैं बुजुर्ग लोग जो कर लेते थे निर्णय ले लेते थे वो हो जाता था लेकिन आज जो है जब से इस संस्था आया है तब से दोनों में तालमेल बढ़िया रहता है बुजुर्ग में और ग्रुप में और 
पहले जो था वो आज नहीं है बदलाव बढ़िया हुआ है और बहुत अच्छा लगता है कि महिलाओं को कभी भी निर्णय लेने का अधिकार नहीं दिया जाता है उनकी क्षमताओं को हमेशा कम करके आका जाता है साथ ही लड़कियों को बहुत ही कम उम्र में उनकी शादियां कर दिया जाता है वहां पे लड़कियों की कोई इच्छा नहीं चलता है वहां पे कोई निर्णय लड़कियों से नहीं लिया जाता है कोई परामर्श उनके साथ नहीं किया जाता है हमारे पापा जी जो थे जो कम ही एज में शादी कर दिए थे तो इस तरह से हमें पहले कुछ नहीं महसूस होता था कि शादी क्या है और जब फिर हम यहाँ आए तो देखे कि घर से बाहर नहीं निकलना है हमको मतलब घर के अंदर ही रहना पाता था तो कोई आए थे तो बोले कि इस तरह का बुख है आप करना चाहते हैं मेरी सास किसी तरह से तैयार हुए अपना हस्बैंड से भी पूछे तो इस तरह से मैं बुक की पूरे जब से हम इस संस्थान में जुड़ी हूँ हम देखते हैं कि बहुत बदलाव आ रहा है बंधन भी टूट गया <laughs> यह भी संस्कृति में कि लड़कियों को घर से निकलने के लिए नहीं दिया जाता है हम सिर्फ स्कूल से घर घर से स्कूल जाते थे लेकिन जैसे कि हम संस्थान प्रक्रिया में आए हमें बाहर जाने का मौका मिला अब हम चुनियत कोऑर्डिनेटर के रूप में सेवा दे रहे हैं हम अपने गांव में भी एक ग्रुप भेज करते हैं और अलग अलग गांव में भी ये हम जाते हैं वहाँ पर भी ये ग्रुप विजिट करते हैं और एक हम एनिमेटर के साथ बात करते हैं ग्रुप के बारे में भी और एक दूसरे के साथ मित्रता बन गया है यहाँ पर संस्कृति में गार्जियन तय करते हैं कि कौन किससे हम बेटी का शादी हो और लड़की का कौन बाजी नहीं लिया जाता है गाँव में हम देखते हैं कि लड़कियों को शादी 12-13 साल में हो जाता है हमको शादी हुआ था तो हम 12 साल के थे हम पति के कभी देखे थे नहीं हम अपना बेटी के काम उम्र में नहीं करने के लिए सोते थे हमको रिवे बेटी अपना पसंद करने के बाद माता पिता से राय ले ली उसको बाद शादी की है हमारे समाज में लड़कियों को पैदा होने पर जो माँ बाप होते हैं दुखी होते हैं और फिर उसको लिए दहेज इकट्ठा करना उनके पास बहुत कर्ज चढ़ जाता अब दिनों दिनों बहुत काफी तिलक हुआ जा रहा है माता पिता से खेत बाड़ी बेच के भाई कुछ करके काफी दहेज दिया जाता है लड़का के रीवा के शादी में कुछ नहीं कुछ नहीं मांग हुआ है रीवा के साधारण रूप में शादी हुआ हम बहुत माता पिता खुश है हमारे यहाँ एक नई सभ्यता एक नई संस्कृति उत्पन्न हुआ है जो लोग शिक्षा के प्रति जागरूक हुए हैं ऊंच नीच का जो है भेद कम हुआ है कि जो महिलाओं को सम्मान पहले से ज़्यादा मिलता है अब लड़कियों का जो है कम उम्र में शादी होना कम हो गया है तो इस तरह से जो है नई संस्कृति का जो है चलन हुआ है So you just get a glimpse of the process that's uh, being involved here, where people are really sort of taking uh, ownership of their own destiny and uh, transforming whatever they need to in their community to make make uh, uh, a better future possible. And we're even seeing environmental implications of that. For example, this question of the equality of men and women is a key to controlling population. Everywhere in the world where women's status improved, the birth rate goes down. So it's really critical that this takes place. So this is happening all over the world. I think there's groups here in, in, uh, in Hawaii that are working on this. This is a group in my community of youth sitting around and, and sort of looking at the issues in their community, trying to elevate their conversation and engage in ethical education that's sort of self-directed and build this service orientation so that they can work towards profound social change. So just in closing, uh, I guess what I've tried to talk about is this idea that this unity among human beings is a, is a requisite for reintegrating the ecosphere. And the next one is that this idea of changing our inner world uh, and our relationships will help to change the outer world. But then the work of healing the planet, working together on that, is one of the things that will unite humanity. So uh, I mentioned there's groups here. We were just in Molokai and we were 
hung out with these kids for a little while, and they're part of this Ruhi process, a junior, junior youth group, and they reflect on concepts like this, the betterment of the world can be accomplished through pure and goodly deeds and through commendable and seemly conduct. So this movement of youth is growing around the world. This is a youth uh, conference in Vanuatu where they're really trying to tackle these profound issues and really look at how do we change our culture and transform our society. So that's enough talking by me. And uh, thanks so much for listening. And, and I'd be happy to have uh, comments, questions. What do, you th what do you think about what I've presented so far? Yes, sir. Yeah, he's asking whether, he, whether um, first of all, he said he agrees with everything I said. That's the important thing. Uh, uh, but then he talked about nuclear power. Does it have a role in the future? And I, you know, I think it may be, what I'm talking about is a different thing, like what type of power systems we use and so on. You know, I have opinions about that, as everybody else does. But I think, you know, until we really look at these sort of deeper cultural transformations, you know, <laughs> In some ways, it probably doesn't matter which, which course we go down. And we probably can't even decide on a course. Like in my country, in Canada, we've decided as, a, as part of the world community to reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide. At the same time, we're deciding to build big uh, pipelines to allow us to produce more of it. You know, so it looks like we're really that's why I say we really need to really reconceptualize things rather and so I, I don't think I'll go into the specifics like that. Yes. Um, you know we, we were we were blessed uh, about a month or so ago um, by having a, another deeply spiritual man that was here in Hawaii who gave a, a similar kind of talk, Bill McKibben, founder of 350.org. And um, and what was what what really struck me, and I, I really love your solutions. It's 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 what you'll hear every week here at at, at Crossroads. Um, but what Bill McKibben said, and I've been really struck by this, is he said we made a mistake early on when we started with 350.org. Is he said we thought we were in an argument, and that if we just made the right argument and got the right information we could change minds we could change spirits and he said what we had to come what we've come to the realization is that we are actually in the middle of a fight a very big fight and then he, and he started to talk about the powers that be that control the fossil fuel industry and things like that that are have been determined for generations to block any sort of thing like this in order to protect their profits and all and so um, I'm, I'm just curious how, where, where you sort of see, I mean, is there, uh, do we sort of operate at kind of a tipping point that if enough people sort of buy an approach, move to an approach like this, that it hits that tipping point that those folks that control all that power and wealth really no longer matter? Or is it a both and? Are we in the midst of, uh, of, of a fight at the same time as we're in a transformation? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I get it, and I get what he's talking about, but I think maybe the idea of a fight is a problem in itself. We're in a fight between different ideologies, between different people, between different interests. And, you know, that kind of uh, struggle is going to unfold on one level, but what I'm interested in is this other level where people work on transformation, transformative process, processes like in this example in India in Bihar if if uh, let's say women went out and demanded equal rights they would get pushed back from conservative people but what they've done is kind of go underneath that level and just start talking to children talking to youth talking to families talking to parents and talking about you know how we could operate differently and it kind of goes outside of the fight 
there's a trans so I'm I'm encouraged by things like that happening. There's Thanks. I came a bit late, and I just saw the part with uh, the introduction of uh, the the solar power in response to some of the the, the demographic changes that are happening, and, and things like that, and some of the transformational things that are happening. But the part that um, the question that I have is really about um, this idea that that um, with this the occurrence of climate change issues taking place. Um, Amartya Sen talks about this idea that during World War II, um, you know, the National Health Service and these social structures came about because of the real, because the, these warlike conditions in the Second World War happening at that time. And so it, there was this challenge that was presented. And then the way that the UK and Britain responded to the challenge was to come up with these innovative ways of of addressing social issues in in the country, so then I'm curious about the dynamic, the the way in which you know this climate change is a man-made issue that's that's come about, but at the same time it's an opportunity to realise unity because we can see that through you know climate doesn't have any regard for boundaries or nation or anything like that. So this idea that then the way in which you know nations can now communities can collaborate to address the a challenge that doesn't tr doesn't fit the traditional kind of conceptual frameworks of of that w that we have um so i'm just curious about you know that there's this you know the phrase uh, when life gives you lemons make uh, make lemonade is this an opportunity to realize unity in fact and it's a way in which we can address 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 that yeah. Yeah, I think so. And in, in my book, I talk about this idea, you know, the, of this twin processes happening of one of, of collapse and one of rebuilding and uh, reintegrating. But I think they, they kind of feed each other in a way, or at least the process of, of uh, the deterioration of the old world order creates conditions that make these new ideas uh, grow. It's kind of like when the forest burns down, uh, New, type, new species come in, there's, there's all kinds of opportunities to transform that system. So I think, you know, even though these awful things we're hearing about on the news are happening and they, they, they're sad and depressing, they also create opportunities for change. I think that's very true. Somebody here had... Well, I, you know, I think um, that there's real opportunities for learning right now because we're in a transition and it's moving forward like it's never done before in terms of, say, moving from uh, petrol to uh, electronic. We're seeing that in countries and uh, major corporations changing and setting goals to phase out and phase in. Um, at the same time, we're even locally seeing only in the last year or two what they're calling the king waves, or what do they call it? King tides. king tides. We didn't hear that a year ago, two years ago. And and we can see it in the back of some of the hotels where the water comes all the way up to the hotel and the sand is all gone. Only a year ago, it went out 10, 20 feet, the sand. You know, so we're starting to see uh, the effects of some of this uh, really dramatically happening here um, let alone in countries in the Pacific where they're underwater right now, you know. Um, how do you get to the base of getting more people involved working together uh, is one question. And the other is, what are the lessons we're learning as this evolution is happening? It's happening in a greater stance right now than it was six months ago. And there's some lessons that we could learn from it, if we can if we can get past the news and get into what's what was helping uh, progressive change. Yeah, that's good. Maybe somebody else has ideas they can respond to that instead of me keep keeping on talking. Um, in relation to that question, I was thinking about. How do children and junior youth and youth um, play a part, right? 
Um, there's this Ruhi Institute that um, he brings up, and it really transforms the mind to understanding we want to look at the needs of the community, needs of our family, needs of the world. And so they put their actions into service, which they naturally and organically think of ideas of, oh, what can we do in our, in our neighborhood? Can we plant some trees like that um, those kids were planting? And that's kind of like, if we do that at a huge scale, which some parts of the world, they are doing it at a huge scale. This um, community building process is very huge in, in places like India. Um, they're seeing huge transformation of, it's really service. It's like looking at how can we be of service to each other, to our world, and seeing what comes about when we do that to answer the needs of, that are out there. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the interesting idea about this institute process is this idea of uh, it being kind of self-replicating. So you you know you start by training a few people in this process, and then they become the animators of other groups, and then those people become animators. So where it happens, like it's happening in Bihar, you're starting to get thousands of people involved, and then you see social change. So in places like my community in Saskatoon and possibly here in Honolulu, I don't know where, where it's at here, but there is this institute happening, and anybody can get involved in it, but it's, uh, it's still at the very uh, basic stages of just starting to learn about how, how do you do this in effective ways. But that's part of the process, too, is, you know, how do we figure this out? How do we figure this out in this community and make it work? Uh, I had the rather cheeky idea of the compost heap theory of history uh, because it seems to me that many of these processes you're talking about are breakdowns of an old order, but that in turn feeds nutrients into the growth processes. Now, that's just a, an idea. It doesn't really go very much further than that. But um, I, I kind of just see examples of it all over the place. I like, can I use that one? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. That was really interesting. Um, it seems like you're, you're looking at integration as as the light of hope that's in the future that we should be working towards. And your primary example is that of a grassroots movement and a change in society through transformation. But the problems we're dealing with are, in many cases, much greater than a community. And at least one of the examples that you presented, the one in China, required a government approach, not a community approach. So which way do you see the integration process going? Are you, you've shown examples from both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, I, I think it's a both end. And, and, you know, I'm emphasizing this approach because I think in the long term, this kind of grassroots movement is the ultimate solution. But that doesn't mean other things aren't happening on other levels and that they don't feed each other. You know, so... You know, many people who become involved with, uh, let's say, the junior youth program, and they become more service-oriented, they also go on and leave that group and become part of, you know, go on to get an education, become engineers, become doctors, become whatever they, whatever they do, and contribute on, this, on that other level that you're talking about. So it's not, they're not exclusive in any way, I don't think. But, I, you know, I've been emphasizing this approach because I think it's the thing that's not really being done that much. You know, there's all kinds of actions on, on the larger scale. Not enough of them, but many are happening. Uh, thank you for a, a very interesting talk. Uh, I used to um, be at the East West Center back in the early 70s, and it, it occurred to me as I was listening to you that I used to hear talks like yours back then up there where there used to be an institute called the Population Institute. Uh, 
and in your talk, I very much appreciate the focus on uh, transformation of societies and communities and also leveling the income inequality. However, there's a the very large elephant, which is that it is population and increase in people which is driving the whole business. Uh, and in your talk, you didn't actually mention population control in one fashion or another. Uh, for example, uh, some European countries and Japan have a difficulty in maintaining population. On the other hand, uh, China, which had a very draconian policy of uh, one child per family, has now abandoned that policy. Uh, so I'm wondering if your choice of not to speak of population control on the various efforts at it is a perhaps choosing a battle we can win for, uh, because the uh, at least the kind of population discussion that I used to hear at the East West Center in the 70s, I, I don't seem to, I, I just don't encounter it uh, in the same way that I used to. And do you think the battle is being won or is, have we gone to a different place? Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. And I, in my book, sort of about population, but I don't actually talk about population very much in the book. Like, what my understanding is that uh, the way demographics are, we're headed towards a world population of 11 billion, approximately, and then it will probably level off. There's a very, there's a very interesting. Uh, have you heard of a man named Hans Rosling? He did some of the most popular TED talks, and he's a Swedish demographer. And he's got a great talk, and it's, I think it's called Why the World's Population Will Not Exceed 11 Billion People. And uh, so I think it's the way I understand it, looking at the population data, is that it's, there's no way that it won't reach something like that amount. Uh, but the, the population growth rate is going down all the time. So it's actually, you know, zero population growth is coming. And uh, so I, I won't go into explaining, and I don't even know if I can explain, but if you watch his video, uh, it's how, why the world's population won't exceed 11 billion, Hans Rosling, and he's, he's a really great speaker and explains it all uh, using, you know, great visual aids and so on, you know. But the other, just one other thing about that, and this, one time I was giving, you know, this talk and this one guy got up and he said, you know, every time a human being is born, we expand our time, the humanity's time, and our capacity to do positive things or negative. So, you know, it's, if we think of population control, like we can't get rid of people, <laughs> you know, but we can start looking at people as having huge capacity to serve others, to serve humanity, and to actually serve the planet and its restoration. So I, you know, maybe part of the solution is also shifting our view about population and looking at ourselves and our potential and our capacities. Yes. I'm thinking about all of this in terms of Hawaii, and I appreciate the, the the sort of global movements and human unity, but doing it at a community level and a local level. And a term I've uh, maybe have been coined, I don't know when it was coined, but I've come to learn it in the last couple of years through the work I'm doing at the university. And that's taking these kinds of large scale efforts or global efforts. And in Hawaii, uh, the term is indigenizing them. In other words, we take the local culture that's, on, that's been on the rise in Hawaii in this sort of, uh, um, reinvigoration um, and celebration and more and more trying to apply that cultural approach, not just a community approach, but really a Hawaiian approach to addressing these kinds of challenges, whether it's food, energy, social problems, um, development, and for lack of a better term, and I, I like the term indigenizing the solutions and the, and the processes themselves. I mean, you talk about getting people together and working out their issues. Hawaiians had, you know, there, there are local processes for that. And I also look at churches. There are religious and spiritual processes throughout the world and all these cultures that address many of these kinds of challenges, maybe not the specific ones, but there's our processes in place. And if we uh, reinvigorate those, 
then I think you have um, something that people can attach to and don't feel like it's foreign or being imposed from the outside. Yeah, I like that. That's great. Did you certainly can, my dear. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate that last comment. I think there's so much in that. There's so much to learn about that. And um, it's interesting because being having been on Molokai just recently, uh, talking with some kapunas, it was very interesting because they were saying that um, from their worldview, uh, there is this, this understanding, this belief system that when whatever it is that I do, I am bringing others with me. And I'm also looking into the future for my, for, for future generations. And that is in all the choices that I make, is, is what, this, what this individual was speaking, right? So, so it's interesting, the, the concept of, of, um, of working with indigenous paradigms and when I look at when what I understand of this process actually of what you're talking about Paul is that is that this is all about one let's say one person rising but really we're trying to in, in this process it's wanting to bring everybody up and forward but also the the idea that especially if the focus is if we're looking at our children this is about the future. So when we're looking at shifting things in our world, this is very forward-looking, right? So perhaps we can look at short-term solutions, but really we're also looking at long-term solutions for generations to come. So how are we doing? Have we maybe sat long enough, or are we a couple more? comments and then shall we break and we can just be together informally um, well I'll make this very very brief but I, I just want to thank you very much Paul for for this address we haven't met before we met for the first time today uh, and and thanks to the crossroads the church to be able to host this event <laughs> And I'm grateful on a totally different level. And that is, I'm a member of the Baha'i Faith and the local spiritual assembly of Baha'is of Honolulu. We have Ruhi classes in, in Honolulu and in most every other community around the Hawaiian Islands. And they're small and they're individual. There's one in Manoa for the study circle, book one. Then Diamond Head, there's children's classes and junior youth empowerment. At KPT, there's all, all three things going on. And, um, and to see it happening on a global level is enriching and encouraging for us on the grassroots because we have the global vision, but we're working at such a small point on the local level, it's just encouraging to hear you bring it all together into a solution. Thank you very much. Yeah, like others, I want to thank you very much for your talk um, and giving us this um, perspective. I have a concern. Uh, and the concern revolves around the word Anthropocene. Uh, it seems to me that, I mean, having watched the environmental movement evolve since the 70s, uh, that one of the things that's fallen away uh, recently, in a sense uh, marked by the arrival of this new concept, supposedly the Anthropocene, uh, is the idea that uh, the problem with humanity's relationship to the environment, to nature, uh, is that we are too human-centered and we're unable to see uh, see the, the kind of hubris that, that governs that human-centered perspective. And uh, the troubling thing with the idea of the Anthropocene is that it seems, it seemed at first that it was a concept that, um, that was almost ironic in its intention. But like other things, like terms like sustainability, which uh, had one sort of uh, linguistic force when it arrived, maybe the late 1980s, um, has been taken up by industry and, and it's become something quite different in most contexts. Uh, 
So that's, that's my general concern is that uh, somehow uh, maybe in the process of indigenizing, as Travis mentioned, uh, uh, our, our concerns uh, and our perspectives, uh, we might return to the idea that, that there's some other center of being than the human. Yeah, that's, I like that, that idea. And actually in my book I do kind of try to develop this other con sort of conceptualization of the relationship with people and other species in the world and so on as well. So I think we're good, uh, good to end the formal part of this and there's refreshments and let's hang around and chat for a while. Thank you.